Ok, welcome everybody. I assume you can all now see me uh, and hear me. Uh, we have now the direct streaming on the Vimeo platform. So welcome everyone to, uh, to this uh, online debate event on uh, energy transition in the north, uh, renewable and nuclear, how and under what condition. So we have uh, a number of guests that they are the expert panel members uh, for this event. We have uh, Professor uh, Corpi Tomolayoko, uh, the Professor Emeritus at the University of Uascola. You have uh, Pitikan and Sirpa, uh, member of the European Parliament. Uh, Ariane Neatte, member of the Finnish Parliament, and Rauli Partner, uh, award-winning writer and uh, an energy analyst. So I will be your host on behalf of the University of Oulu that is organizing this event. My name is Antonio Calò. I'm a postdoctoral researcher on uh, uh, Arctic energy uh, resources and uh, nexus. And for those of you that wonder what nexus might actually mean, it means the, the relationship, the close relationship and the synergy that you have between energy, water and land use. That is my field of research. Um, how uh, we can actually frame, I will give immediately the floor to our guests that have a lot to say. Uh, just a few words to frame this uh, initiative, frame this, uh, this debate. So how do we frame it? So when, uh, when we are talking about uh, energy transition in the north, so when we are talking about uh, the direction where we are going in terms of energy uh, system infrastructure, energy mix, uh, usually in the conversation we are talking about the process of democratization through participation. What does it mean? Well, frame it in, in many ways. You can actually frame this in many ways. Either you are considering yourself a person that might consider or not installing a solar panel on, uh, on the roof of your house or perhaps you are actually supporting different kind of uh, energy systems through the electricity contract that you decide to have with your energy retailer or you're perhaps considering your role as a citizen uh, and member of your community supporting decision makers and policy makers in uh, choosing different paths when it comes to energy policy of your region or your country uh, at multiple levels, in different ways, uh, the role of the citizen, uh, the population role in active role in choosing our energy future is growing uh, in uh, intensity and scale. So that's why we are talking, uh, talking about the process of democratization through participation of the energy system. And as in many, uh, as in all democracy, democracy is effective uh, when decision makers, members that participate in the decision making process, are actually, uh, they do not just have the opportunity, but they also have the capacity to make uh, informed and educated decisions. That's why we are actually it's important to have events where uh, people are able to get uh, a better understanding of not only just the complexity associated to certain decisions or certain processes, but also through the um, possibility to uh, elevate the debates, appreciate the, the complexity of the consequences and the circumstances associated to certain energy related uh, choices. So in this context, it's important to actually have the possibility to have a direct communication with, uh, with experts in the field, experts that we have here in terms of like a decision making process, energy policy, and also from uh, technical aspects, experts in, uh, in, uh, in uh, energy system analysis. So we have some uh, connection issues with uh, with Sirpa Pietikan and that is trying to come back online as soon as possible, I hope. Uh, in the meantime, 
I just pass the floor to all the other experts. And uh, the first one uh, that I will be happy to give the floor to is uh, Atarian. Please feel free to introduce yourself. Hi, uh, Antonio. Thank you for, for inviting me to the, to the debate. And, and hello, everyone. Following online, so I'm Atte Harjanne. I'm a member of parliament, uh, the parliament of Finland, representing Green Party and, and the constituency of Helsinki uh, since 2019. And uh, I'm also a member of C Helsinki City Council, so also involved in local politics uh, here in Helsinki. Uh, in the parliament, I sit in the Commerce Committee, Defense Committee and Grant Committee. And uh, the Commerce Committee is, is important in, for today's topic, although it's called Commerce Committee, Energy Policy is actually under its uh, role. So uh, we, we uh, uh, look at energy, energy policy in the parliament within the co committee. So that's interesting. Uh, uh, about my background um, more before before uh, the parliamentary career uh, i worked as a researcher in, in the finnish meteorological institute where my topic was uh, socioeconomic impact research so looking at the social and economic costs of extreme weather and climate change especially climate change and climate change adaptation and then i've also been involved to some extent in researching energy policy and writing about that as well so i have um some limited expertise also on the academic academic side and the, on the on the topic and uh, i guess yeah yeah i guess that that's it uh, regarding the grant committee i could also say that, that that's the one that looks into eu policy in the in the parliament so uh, also eu being quite an important important player in in uh, energy policy um, that's that's um, of course an uh, interesting perspective as well. Uh, maybe next slide. Yep. So uh, th this is the picture. I, I, if I give a presentation about almost anything, this is a picture uh, that I'd like to uh, that I like to put in in the presentation. Um, in any case, so so I would say this is the big picture uh, relevant for energy policy for today's topic. So. Uh, the black line here is a compilation of, of uh, IPCC 1.5 degree um, scenarios or modeling runs. And it shows how the carbon emissions, global, global carbon emissions have developed this far and how they should develop in order to be able to reach or have a chance of limiting the warming to 1.5 degrees. Uh, it's a bit of a crude picture. It's just on all the data points are by decade and so on. But what you should be interested in about is, is the shape of the curve. What we've seen is, uh, is that I think it shows the scale of the climate change challenge we're facing. That's, I think the scale is it's still not understood in public debate and po policy making uh, or the implications of this scale. So what we see there is that we should cut the emissions now, we should be on a path of cutting the emissions now faster than they were historically accumulated. And, and we should reach global net zero in emissions in around 2050. And after that, after 2050, the work isn't over, we should be taking off carbon from the atmosphere on an industrial scale, huge scale, if you look at this, uh, compared to the global emissions this far. So that's 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 one thing. That's that's what we should be doing at the, at the at the moment. And what that would mean is that we we need to have an energy economy that runs on energy sources that are not uh, emitting carbon. That's that's where it kind of boils down. To. And what makes the challenge even harder is the the red line, which is the population projection uh, by the UN. I think it's a uh, medium projection but again here the curve of the shape uh, the shape of the curve is the important part so there's more of us all the time and even though the uh, population growth is stabilizing uh, there's still more to come and what this means is that we still need a lot of energy so we we are we cannot uh, tackle the decarbonization the reduced reduction of emissions by using less energy because 
we need more energy to, to sustain uh, some adequate level uh, of life, quality of life for everyone on the planet. So this is a, this is a, you could you could draw as well a, a GDP curve there, but that's a bit of a contested uh, indicator. But the bottom line is that we need energy to run sustainable life uh, on a global scale, and that means that we need massive amounts of uh, low carbon energy, sustainable energy in the future. So we should be building that a lot. And it also tells that whatever we do, uh, there are local solutions. Um, and you could look at this from different scales, but all the big, big issues, we should be using technology that scale globally, that can be used to, the, to tackle this global challenge. Then there's a curve that isn't actually one curve, but an but a, uh, issue as well that isn't in the picture, but what I would like to put in the picture as well is uh, the other global uh, mega challenge, which is uh, the loss of biodiversity, the sixth extinction, mass extinction. And that means that at the same time we are uh, reducing emissions, we should also be reducing our pressure on land and sea to the ecosystems. And that limits uh, another option, which is uh, how much land and how much biomass we can we can take off from the ecosystem. So this is, the I think, the not exactly the nexus uh, Antonio was talking about, but one perspective on the same issue that we need to uh, tackle this global energy challenge and uh, we need to tackle it kind of everywhere at the same time. And I think this is the, this is the perspective I like to bring into, into any energy policy debate. Uh, sometimes it's better to look at the local issues than the global issues, but any local solutions, any domestic solutions, any European solutions should be part of uh, this uh, tackling this this global challenge and every re emission reduction policy uh, should be a step on the path that takes us to the uh, that the, gets us forward in this in this black line. Um, so that's that's the big picture of decarbonization challenge compared, uh, which is then uh, 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 goes together with the with the challenge of uh, of uh, stopping the the, the loss of biodiversity but yeah that would be my my two cents uh, at this point and looking forward for the for the other experts on the or the even more experts than me on the panel i'd like to hear your thoughts thank you, thank you very much at uh, this point we, we skipped uh sirpa that is back online uh sirpa are you there yes i'm here so uh, first... I will give you the floor if you would be so kind to introduce yourself in your position in the next five minutes so everyone is more familiar with uh, who you are and where you stand on the issue. Thank you very much. And first of all, I'm very uh, sorry for my very bad uh, broadband connection here. And so that's why I'm not uh, able to uh, have the video connection and still I'm sort of a dropped off. So I might be in and out, but um, I'll, I'll reconnect myself always if I'm dropped out. Okay, so I'm Sirpa Pietikan, a member of the European Parliament, working there in the Econ Committee with Economic and Fiscal Matters and Environment Committee. And I've concentrated quite a lot on the circular economy and this uh, paradigm change that is uh, uh, a, a magnitude scale that is towards the sustainability so that is the famous uh, planetary boundaries. My background is uh, in economics and uh, business administration from Helsinki School of Economics before, uh, uh, before I, I came to be uh, the member of the parliament and I was the minister for the environment during the Rio negotiations. And there, uh, I mean, not in Rio, but uh, in Helsinki School of Economics, I studied part of the strategy and part of it, uh, uh, the negotiation theories and the decision-making modeling and all that, and that uh, stems at, at least partly on my opinion. And that sort of uh, leads uh, to me, to my sort of a <clears throat> basic uh, analysis or assumptions about uh, the nuclear and uh, the challenge that are very uh, uh, precisely uh, described already. First of all, this is the question of a risk perception, what we have about nuclear. 
And I don't know, you probably have uh, read your Nassim Nicholas uh, Taleb's Black, uh, Black uh, Swan, the theory that uh, uh, explains the disproportionate role of uh, high profile, hard to predict, and rare events that are beyond the realm of normal expectations in history, science, finance, and technology. So the rare events uh, that uh, using scientific methods owing to the very nature of small probabilities are hard to predict. And then the third point, of course, of that is the psychological biases that blinds people both individually and collectively to uncertainty and uh, to the rare events uh, that are, have massive role in histor historical affairs that are um, um, with no, uh, small numbers. And if we think of nu uh, nuclear, and uh, of course, then it is the nuclear waste and it is the question of the nuclear hazards. Uh, one could describe it uh, as a bit of negative lottery. And our mind is uh, geared the way of thinking that positive uh, small uh, probabilities is something that we look forward, like quite a lot of us has uh, played lotto uh, at some point of our lives. But then again, we think that negative lotteries never happen to us. And if you sort of take the thinking of the sustainability from the environment, the most important uh, uh, parts there is the precautionary principle. So keep it simple, stupid. If you can uh, avoid that kind of a black swans or big risks, and actually climate change is not a black swan, it is a white swan in, in right of, in front of ahead of us. But uh, here, uh, sort of the nuclear is the black swan, in my uh, opinion. If you can do it with lower risks and better probabilities, you better do that. So that's why I'm uh, hesitant overall for that kind of solutions and technologies that uh, uh, are uh, lo loaded with uh, negative risks, uh, maybe somewhere in the future. Then uh, if we take another point, and that is the scale and pace of decarbonization, and we know how long it takes to build the nuclear uh, power, we would need to do the drastic decisions by 2030 and latest by 2050, or then we are actually uh, in uh, uh, probably exceeding the tipping points. We can actually increase substantially the renewables <clears throat> that are coming cheaper and cheaper like solar and with it is just a question of a political will but we couldn't even technically build that uh, uh, needed <clears throat> needed uh, nuclear energy capacity all over the world and not even in in, in europe just to uh, remind uh, what have been the the times of uh, building uh, for example in in finland and then again we all know if there's the will and there's the finance how uh, fastly you can build and <clears throat> scale up the, uh, uh, the, the solar uh, energy, for example. There, of course, you, you need uh, the combination uh, balancing power. And that comes to my next point. Actually, the, uh, the renewables and nuclear are not uh, happy marriage. It's an unfortunate mismatch because you can't use nuclear as this kind of adjusting power to uh, add to the grid, the needed power to fill in the changes and variability in uh, renewables. So you need the batteries, you need the turbine, gas power. Yes, it is fossil, but you can sort of diminish that uh, amount depending how large scale uh, <clears throat> renewables production you have and how good supergrid uh, structure you have and how massive energy efficiency investments you have. Then the second point is that uh, if we look from the business perspective and uh, the finance industry perspective, the profitability is actually pretty much, much lost in nuclear. Not to talk about if it would need to bear its own risks, then it would be a totally lost case. And then last but not least, and that might be the details for, for this or some later debate, we always always would need to know what kind of a nuclear are we talking about? Are we talking about the existing 
uh, technologies what we have or what are we talking about uh, uh, instead the new uh, uh, f- uh, fusion so are we talking about fusion or fission are we talking about small scale or large scale nuclear uh, and uh, how easily dismantle and what are the new avenues with the waste because just dumping it and hoping crossing your fingers uh, for thousands and tens of thousands of the years uh, we all know is not actually the solution so this is my just sort of uh, the headings of the problematic of the nuclear uh, to be discussed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Silpa. Perfect timing. So um, again, if um, I can actually give then the floor to Yoko to be able to present himself, introduce himself and, and his position on the issue. And I remember everyone that is listening that uh, after this five minutes presentation from each of the participants, we will have the bulk of our conversation and for those of you following through video stream, uh, Vimeo streaming, please send us also your questions because at the end of this debate, we will have uh, hopefully a part dedicated to the questions coming from the audience. So, Yoko, please, the floor is yours. All right. Uh, I'm uh, Emeritus Professor at the University of Uvascula, as mentioned before. And uh, I'm the founder and the chairman of the Renewable Energy Program at the University which was running from 2003 to 2013. And uh, after my retirement, I also joined the group of uh, eight of my uh, energy uh, colleagues. And uh, we spent something like one and a half years in order uh, to write a roadmap for Finland on its uh, future energy policy. And we have published that in a book uh, called Maamme Energia by Into Kustannus. And uh, my first slide, uh, so my background is is, uh, physical chemistry and physics. So I'm so-called hardcore scientist, so to say. and my first slide is, is one of the oldest sl- slides I've been using over these last 15 years when I've given public presentations on energy uh, options. And uh, it's uh, from, from the International Energy Association and their forecast for the energy sources for the, for the years to come all the way to 2100. And uh, surprisingly, when I follow this curve, I mean, that uh, 2020, we are right on the track. And what you can see from these uh, um, different uh, proportions that the, the important things are solar, wind, and biomass. And uh, you have some geothermal and uh, the forecast is that nuclear power is to remain constant over the years to come. And, and this uh, curve, set of curves also describes what uh, was said before by Atte, that the population grows. We are now 7 billion and we will be uh, by 2040, we, we, we will be uh, 10, 10 billion. And, uh, and uh, the most of the energy demand comes from non ECD countries, developing countries. And uh, we don't have any, any, any moral. Uh, reasons to say that uh, these developing countries should not aim for the same kind of living standards than we have, because we have done it before. And basically, at early uh, 19th century, basically using coal. So basically, the future energy demand by 2040, is roughly 50,000 terawatt hours. 
And this 50,000 terawatt hours is, is equivalent to output from more than 400 of 450 nuclear power plants. So we should be, by that time, be able to build them. And that seems to be a totally impossible task. So the solution is, is relies on, on, on renewable energy sources. And also, it's not only the energy sources and more of energy, but it's also energy saving. And, uh, and the, the, the other thing I, I want to point out is that this energy change or climate change fight is a very slow process. I just checked the numbers uh, just recently that, uh, for instance, the oil industry revenues per year are something like 1,500 billion US dollars. Car industry employs uh, 2.5 million people and they, their turnover is 300 billion dollars. Air traffic is uh, one of the worst uh, customers, the best customers for oil, oil industry, as well as the, the ground transportation. So there are 11, there are 1.1 billion vehicles on the roads. They, would, they won't disappear from the roads very soon. And there will be every year, 90 million new vehicles made, and from them, 200, 2, 2 million electrical cars by 2018. So electrical cars will not be the solution as it is now. But let's go to the next slide. And uh, this is the recommendations, uh, uh, general recommendations from the team of nine professors who represent energy economy, nuclear, econ nuclear power, nuclear research, uh, renewable research, uh, the social aspects of energy policy and so on. So this is our summary that by 2030, investing in renewables in Finland, this country, doesn't matter if it's the north or south, we could have 18 terawatt hours of electricity at the price of 35 euros per megawatt hour. 40 terawatt hours of primary energy at 27 euros per megawatt hour. And means to reach, reach targets need development of wood and farming biomass utilization. And I'm very positively uh, surprised that, for instance, biomass is converted into biofuels today in Finland in a massive way. Wind power is a forgotten source in Finland. Yet, in January 2020, I got the latest numbers from the Wind, en wind Energy Association. There are plans for 18 gigawatts of wind power in Finland. And it's funny that we had Professor Ben Sørensen at our energy technology graduate school to give a talk in 2005, and he said that Finland has very good wind power con conditions on the western coast. And when I listened to the uh, energy company lobbies at that time, they said to me, Yoko, wind power should be built where wind is blowing. Heat pumps, they are emerging also in, in apartment houses. 30% of the, of the this uh, apartment house uh, borders are very interested in investing money on heat pumps of, the, of, of their housing and trying to give up the district heating. And then PV and solar heat, small and large scale, uh, PV in Finland produces, for instance, 36 kilowatt, uh, kilowatt uh, panels in Finland. Uh, according to our exact measurements, 
produce roughly 5,000 5, kilowatt hours a year. And solar heats is 70% efficient and 10 square meters of solar heat collectors, they produce something like 300, 500 kilowatt hours per year. And the finally, bed lighting is going to save in Finland only one output from one nuclear power plant. And new jobs will be created. That's about my message so far. Thank you very much, Yoko. Uh, I'm keeping track of the questions that are already coming through Vimeo uh, chat. So looking forward to an interesting conversation uh, later on. Uh, Raoli, at this point, uh, you are the last expert members, the one missing. So please, the floor is yours. So. Hello, everyone. Good to be here. And thanks for the invitation, Antonio. So um, as you briefly mentioned, I'm a science writer and, and an analyst. Been writing a couple of books during the last almost 10 years. Oh, God, time flies. Um, starting with the kind of more general oil question, how dependent we are of oil. There is a Finnish version of, of this Suomi Öljynjälkeen, but I, since we are doing this in English, I I put the more globalized version there, the world after cheap oil. Uh, incidentally, right after we published that, the high oil price crashed, so <laughs> there was that. Um, then I have been writing more about climate in 2015, we made this uh, with, with Janne Korhonen, Climate Gamble, Uhkapeli Ilmastolla. It's a book that has been published in, uh, I think, seven languages by now. Mm. And uh, after that, there was Musta Hevonen, which is the Finnish version of the Dark Horse. But, but here's uh, it was also published in 2020 as an English version. And in 2017, we wrote Energy and Aika, which will also be published in English. I would very much hope so this year. And it got the Science Book of the Year award back then as well. And I've been writing reports uh, on, on the sustainability of nuclear as well. That's uh, on the right, you can see the it's an assessment of on the sustain sustainability of nuclear power for the EU taxonomy consultation back in 2019 when that consultation was held. I'm also an activist. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of eco Modernist Society of Finland and their energy analyst nowadays. And uh, a couple of years ago, I co-founded a non-profit independent think tank called Think Atom. Uh, I think that's enough about me. So let's move to the next slide. What, what my, I have almost the same picture, but a little bit more complex version because I didn't have time to make a simple one. If you start from the upper, upper left corner, that's what we are facing. That's from the IPCC 1.5 degrees of warming special report. Uh, it's a collection of all, this, all the scenarios that they did did for that that report and as Atte already mentioned it shows that we have to be pretty much carbon neutral by 2050 and that that means that for example the the graph that Yoko had on his first slide I checked out that there was quite a bit of fossil fuels even in 2050 and and even later like 80 percent what what's it's now so that's that scenario from IEA is basically a climate disaster. It's not two, two degrees. That's that's three or four degrees from from what I could say. So this is one point five. Arguably, it's pretty much lost on us, but we still have to <laughs> aim for it. We we after all we promised to do that in the Paris Agreement, and from that same study. If you move to the upper right corner, is the average for four main scenarios in the summary for policymakers of of that that report. 
how much nuclear we should have by 2050. As you can see, it has to grow four or five times. It depends a little bit on the scenario. This is the average of the four main scenarios that we are used in the summary for policymakers. But yeah, it has to grow a lot. And like we already heard, getting nuclear started takes some time. I mean, in the West, in, in Europe and in the US, we pretty much gave up on, on building new nuclear for 20 or 30 years. And only with Olgilota 3 and, and some other projects, we started to build back that expertise on how to build nuclear. And it's been taking a lot of time and money. As we can see, it, they, they have not been the best project. <laughs> I can say that. But if you check out what IPCC is recommending, and, and this four or five times of nuclear from current levels, that comes after we grow wind and solar and biomass and, and all, all of that stuff, at least as much uh, or, or even much more than we what we see with nuclear here. So it's not a question of, well, why don't we just do it with renewables? It's yes, we will do it with renewables, but as we saw in Yoko's picture, it'll mean a climate disaster. So if you want to de-risk our climate mitigation, you use all the tools. And now that we've been learning, and rebuilding all the supply chains and all, all that stuff in Europe and the US and the West, it would be a really, really bad choice to kind of stop building nuclear just as we are relearning how to do it. And this is evident in other countries. I mean, outside of the US and, and, and European Union, other countries have been building nuclear quite on time, quite on budget. It's pretty fast, actually. And uh, yeah, and, and for, for, the, for the final thing on the sustainability and, and safety and the waste and all that kind of worries that people have, there just came out a um, technical assessment of nuclear energy with respect to the do no significant harm criteria, criteria of regulation on the taxonomy that everybody's been talking about. We can maybe talk about the taxonomy a bit more. So uh, a version of, of that technical assessment was just leaked uh, two days ago. And the key finding is that the analysis did not reveal any science-based evidence that nuclear energy does more harm to human health or to the environment than other electricity production technologies already included in the taxonomy as activities supporting climate change mitigation. So we pretty much have what the European Commission set this, this expert group to do, the evaluation of how sustainable is nuclear. And it is at least as sustainable as anything else in the taxonomy. So on, on that grounds, I, I see no science-based reason for not including nuclear in the taxonomy, because we also know that the cost of financing is a big deal in nuclear and taxonomy's purpose is to lower the cost of financing. So the financing cost on a project can be half of the price of the nuclear energy in the end. And that's because high interest rates. So if it's included in the taxonomy, it gets lower interest rate and suddenly nuclear starts to make much more sense. But uh, given that there was a lot of stuff that I heard that I wanted to start commenting right away, but I guess, I guess it's, it's not, not, it's not it's the business not of this part. I will, I will okay. stop my yeah. share here. Thank you. Yeah, no, that is actually perfect way to, to stop because that would be ideal for everyone then uh, to, to be online and uh, how we can actually stop the, the, the presentation part and perhaps go to the juicy part of the, the 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 appointment so uh there have been a lot of issues that being have been raised during your presentation i hope we can actually discuss them little by little through through the debate uh so if i can actually start 
since we have to kind of break the ice and warm up the muscles, uh, if I can actually start with the more general questions, perhaps to, uh, I would actually ask it to Sirpa, considering that is a more general policy, energy policy question, but, uh, but please, for all the other members, feel free to step in and, and, uh, and uh, spark the debate. So the idea is that we, we heard a lot of large scale figures, large scale numbers and energy policy in terms of macroscopic trends, where we are going as a society, where we are going as a country or EU policies or general global trends. So as a member of the Europe, uh, European Parliament, if you would actually have to translate that in uh, in um, near future choices that the average person will have to start to make, how this energy transition would look like for the average citizen, uh, either from a more practical point of view, solar panels on the roof or electricity bill, or perhaps choices in terms of like which energy policy choices we are going to be called to make as citizens. So if you would actually be able to translate in practical terms in our everyday life for the average person, how that transition translates? Yes, thank you. Uh, I, I will comment that also, but uh, just about this uh, analysis about science-based evidence that nuclear energy does not do no more, no, doesn't uh, do no significant harm compared to any other electricity production technologies. Yes, if you look uh, to, to the history, uh, you back a couple of tens of years, uh, that is the case, but it uh, takes a heck and a nerd to say thousands of years from now, the same thing. And this was exactly the risk perception, the black swan effect, what I took into account. So let's not to, uh, to create fallacies there. The second issue is the point that the nuclear creates a large pump of energy every time it's introduced in the markets. And so it uh, creates uh, a, a demand, for, uh, a pressure, a, a, pu a push effect for cheap energy. And it makes actually energy efficiency investments less profitable. And it makes this paradigm change because this is a Copernican change. It is a total paradigm change. It is in, in a circular economy about tenfold efficiency in material use. And that the same goes in energy. And the more you keep on pushing the same and you say that, okay, this is the only way, the closer you get to the total sort of a systemic failure, not in my lifetime, but uh, I'm, I'm sort of a key to think a bit longer. And then we come to uh, your question uh, about how then we should look it like. And that needs the, uh, uh, the, the classification, it need, uh, needs huge investment, but less than the nuclear. First, to create a common European energy market. Secondly, to build super grids and smart grids. So uh, you can take 20% of the electric consumption if you create a better high voltage uh, connect connections. And smart grids is sort of, uh, as you all know, how you stabilize the energy production and uh, consumption and also in the small scale. Then the second one is renewable within 30 years or where, where it is uh, possible. And that is, of course, the um, uh, the uh, large scale uh, solar energy production, and this is, for example, the a uh, lot of discussed and little done desertic, because in theory, and of course, this is not the way to how to do it. Uh, One hundred uh, square kilometers in the Sahara could um, uh, uh, bring all the energy, electricity, energy to Europe. What we would need, even if we would, instead of a decrease in we would count in the increase of energy consumption. So there's the, the potential is there, but you need the grids and you need to build the large scale uh, solar energy, but you need, uh, uh, need to build the small scale too. Uh, this is partly uh, autonomous uh, uh, units in, in small scale like housing, 
but it is a large scale, small scale. So basically you can cover all the roads and you can cover basically all facilities, roofs and so on uh, with solar panels and increase the wind to its all possible. We've talked 40 years about the wind energy in, in Finland and somehow we it doesn't get the wind uh, under the wings uh, as it should. And by that, and that is McKinsey report and even the Shell was part of that financing this report already uh, 10 years ago when they confirmed the same result. It was like five years ago that yes, we could build either with existing nu- nuclear or without it, the energy grid. But it means that in the connection, this is my last sentence, you need this balancing combination uh, support power at least for 10, 15 years. Sirpa, if I can interrupt you, because I, I can see Ate raised his hand, would like to answer to your an- answer. To your answer. <laughs> Please, Ate. Yeah, thank you. I, uh, th- thanks, Sirpa. I would... Energy efficiency is a good, great thing. It's a good thing. But saying that we should limit our energy consumption, <laughs> first on a global level, that we should limit it or put it uh, even decrease it, that that would condemn billions of people into poverty for good. So a lot of the poverty in the world is energy poverty in nature. And it's in that context, it's very problematic to take energy, decreasing ener- absolute energy uses uh, as a goal. But also the electricity in, in here in Finland, for example, if we looked at the industry, uh, the industries in Finland did this uh, low carbon roadmaps just recently last year and, and uh, they, they show that the demand of clean electricity is huge in the future and it's, it's a, a prerequisite to, to a decarbonization of the economy. And uh, I think it's like around 55% increase in electricity demand in Finland for the industries to decarbonize. So there is need for all the low carbon energy we can produce. As for the Sahara thingy, I think it's a very colonial idea in the sense that but as, as you actually Professor Korpidam showed pretty well, the biggest demand of the energy is somewhere else. So it's a, I don't like the idea that we could outsource this to Africa our clean energy production. We, we have all the means to do it in, here in Europe as well. Uh, regarding, uh, I, I think, regarding the, the, the slides shown by, by Serpa and Yoko, I think they tell a story of failure. The, the fact that uh, nuclear construction now, or fact, but the, the thing that nuclear construction now is is quite slow, especially in Western countries. Uh, there's, it's faster elsewhere, and that it's expensive. That describes actually, it's not a, it's a, it's not it's not physics, it's economics regulated by politics. So it's it's a failure in policy, and I think uh, the graphs shown by Yoko actually show the results of the failure. And that's what we need to fix. And I would like to say, uh, Rauli already mentioned that the, uh, the EIA scenarios show climate disaster, but they also show a biodiversity disaster. That the volumes of biomass uh, put to energy use would mean a huge dip, uh, pressure on, on uh, ecosystems already that have uh, too much of pressure. But I think that uh, regarding Antonio's uh, question, a uh, short comment on that as well. And I would say that the less the, the uh, the energy transition shows to a regular Jane or Joe, the better, because that means that we have less uh, resistance to change. So if we can produce clean energy 24-7 uh, coming from your uh, socket uh, or battery, the better. So, so that, that's, 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 that's the thing. I mean, they, we need, we need the consumer changes as well. And of course, it's great to have uh, small scale solar and rooftops uh, stuff like that on on the whole scale that's more like an f- energy efficiency uh thing but still important and good good to have um, electric vehicles another another big thing but again here i would emphasize that change itself the the less uh, need for for consumer change the better but that doesn't mean that of course there is there is need for uh for for dimensioned energy efficiency uh, and also also some like a consumer consumer level uh, energy uh, changes of energy energy use 
but I guess there are hands raising already now. So yeah, I, I was wondering. Uh, I think I saw Yoku hand raising before, and you, you we mentioned several times. So if you would like to respond, okay. So my my response to this one point one billion uh, developing country people or uh, population they don't have access to regular electricity and uh, again because i'm deeply involved in photonics i mean it, uh, this uh, kind of uh, there, there, there's a commercial activity right now for this uh, this uh, group of people on this planet and surprisingly i have 29 slides sent to uh, of uh, Antonio, but uh, they they didn't they included this. But uh, any case, most of these people they live on the solar belt, and uh, there there has been, for instance, an an PhD thesis recently defended at Alta University, by, led by Peter uh, Peter Lund, and uh, this kind of micro PV uh, PV. Uh, power generating stations that give a family farmhouse 30 watts of power, three LED lamps, and a plug to recharge your mobile and your laptop. And these have been tested in India, northern India, for, for more than one year, and uh, all, all these uh, functions have been uh, analyzed. And this is my approach to 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 um, my propo proposition to to support this uh, this uh, part of the uh, global population. Uh, they call it microeconomy. It's a new field of economy. So you should be able to sell these devices at very low price. And these companies who make these uh, devices, they should make a profit. So it's a very demanding new, new uh, business that is emerging on the on the on the planet. And the nice Sorry thing about you. Equator, I mean, you have to remember that you can very nicely tune your solar panels over one axis because the sun rises from the east and goes down in the west. Sorry to interrupt you. I think Sirpa was raising her hand. And yes, thank you. And I tried to comment very briefly. Please. I've uh, heard about 30 years, 40 years, this laughing around uh, uh, about the scale of the solar economy. And still, with this kind of a political attitudes, it has increased and get its important position and it's getting it globally. Plus, we are uh, building the super and smart grids globally. And that uh, that matter is going to change the paradigm and uh, uh, the energy con uh, construction more uh, the the infrastructure more than what we think. Then about the colonialism, well, what do you would call it when we buy oil and where did we buy from Russia the uh, nuclear? Then, well, there this is uh, and finance it too. This is just a sort of a, a throwback. But then I, uh, I, I talked about the Europe and if you want uh, to uh, uh, decrease the energy uh, poverty in Africa, are you going to do it by building nu nuclear power there or are you going to introduce new technologies and enable the use of solar energy there? And that matter, if he would buy it in from Europe, it would give them income and the possibilities to increase the production and use it, use in um, in Africa too. So this is working for the energy poverty, not the uh, vice versa. And last point, and that is about the um, uh, 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 the uh, endless growth of uh, consumption of materials and energy. And actually, the only end, almost endless source of the energy is the solar and how we can figure out to how to use that, and we all know that. And on the other ways, you are just supporting that kind of an idea that you could use more stuff, more energy, and circular economy means you increase the quality of life. 
by uh, putting the raw materials on circulation and increasing the use efficiency and prolong prolonging the, the use. And this is, for example, mobility as a service instead sorry. of increasing cars and cars. So it is totally different kind of a concept. But so, I guess sorry to interrupt you. Sorry to interrupt you because I uh, that were a lot of topics that were very interesting and I would like to actually expand and I saw that there is Rowley queuing in line for for answering. So since Rowley would be would have been my target for the next question, I take the opportunity for uh, I take the opportunity to capitalize on a number of issues that you mentioned and then transform that one in a question for Rowley. So we go, I hope, a little bit beyond the usual debate, renewables versus nuclear. So it has been mentioned uh, both energy efficiency and, and smart grids. And these are, and, and it has been also uh, described as a game changer and, and a paradigm shift in, in, in many respects. So again, this one is a question for Rowley. Um, now we see that in terms of energy, energy efficiency, when we are talking about developing these smart energy systems, smart grids, where we are much more interconnected, the, the concept of energy efficiency is a little bit changing. We are not just talking about how much we are consuming or producing, but also the, the element of when uh, comes into the game. It's like, when are we consuming and how much? and or when we are producing and how much and this one becomes much more relevant now that we are also from the supply side at least we are considering introducing a significantly larger component of renewable energy which have uh, introduced an extra level of variability so the 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 average co2 let's put it in this way oversimplify the average co2 emissions that we can associate to a kilowatt that we consume is changing hour by hour in the same way the price changes because we are consuming more in some peak hours uh, than others at the same time when we are consuming uh, doesn't have necessarily doesn't necessarily translate in the same environmental impact if we are considering at least for the sake of argument right now only co2 emissions so once we take that one into perspective the problem of overlapping our consumption profile and the, the the supply side comes into the game because on one hand we have the challenge of consuming energy using energy when renewable energies are producing if we are considering a renewable a renewable energy mix but on the other side we know that nuclear for example works very well on large scale and is not really flexible it, currently it is not variable so it is not really well equipped to answer to the need of flexibility that a smart energy system would require usually this one is the game so how would you frame then how do you see these issues where we are a bit stuck where uh, renewables work very well when we have to address this consumption only coupled with significant flexibility from the consumption side or storage and then on the other side we have nuclear that is not really flexible so feel free to expand on that and and complain <laughs> if you want to okay yeah i will start by complaining <laughs> uh, so the first complaint is that you said that nuclear is not flexible. Actually, it is quite flexible. It can be, even the current fleet of reactors that were built in the 70s and 80s can be run quite flexibly. And they have been run, running flexibly, for example, in, in France and in Germany, where they load, follow, or do this kind of following for, for the renewables as well. So it's possible. It's a matter of uh, well, obviously, it's a matter of economics because it's a large plant and it has almost no um, dynamic costs. So you pay the certain cost, whether you are producing at 100% or 50%, because the fuel, there is no fuel savings to be had. So you want to run it. So it's, a, it's about economics that you prefer to run it at 100%. But if you have an incentive, to do load following, you can do it. 
and you if you license the, the the reactor in a way for example in finland all the reactors here have been licensed to do base load so which is like running all the time at, at full time uh but there is it's possible to relicense them for load following for example but why would one one do that do you have to be sorry. an economic reason uh, if i can actually then ask yep. you a question yep. specifically on that sorry to interrupt you at then i will i will i don't want to to skip the line i apologize but usually i i heard this argument and i heard also the counter argument that i would like you to address that for example when we compare nuclear in finland and nuclear in france uh it's quite often mentioned that is not a fair argument because for example Finland has few nuclear power stations and nuclear represent around 30-35%. So, I mean, it's around one quarter of our electricity mix, soon expected to be around one third, roughly speaking. But France, we are talking about 70-80% to 80% of electricity produced with nuclear. So having a number of reactors that, that can actually play uh, on the electricity market is one one thing, but if uh, in Finland we have one nuclear power station, for example, that makes uh, this uh, load uh, following the load in terms of output, is not even uh, responding to the market. There is a chance that it might actually shape the market if you are actually playing with ten mm percent -hmm. of the output in once. Uh, what do you think of that argument? How would you frame it? Yeah, I mean, or obviously, just it, for skipping the line. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, it's a different case for France because they have such a large share of nuclear, and they have designed the whole system to be run like it's it's running. And we have designed our system to be running like ours. We have much more hydro, so we can do the day and night cycle with with mostly hydro, for example. We don't have to do it with with anything else. Whereas in in France, you have some nuclear power plants that shut down for the weekend because there is less demand. Uh, regarding on this kind of mismatch of, of renewable and, and nuclear, well, like I said, nuclear can be flexible as well. And actually many of the new reactor designs, I, I know Sirba Prot actually could point that we need to define what kind of nuclear we are talking about. If it's small nuclear, big nuclear, uh, fusion or fission. I'm Right now I'm shifting to small advanced fission reactors which are being developed a lot of them are being developed in this in mind that they anticipate that there will be a high share of wind and solar in the grids which is quite likely because we need to expand those as well which means that there will be a lot of more of this variability that you you said that then we need to control maybe with batteries and then smart grids and and all uh, flexibility on the demand side and all of this stuff well all of these actually make it also easier to have base load because they also answer to the demand fl fluctuations. So it's great to have storage and flexibility in the demand side. Uh, but you can also do that with, with these nuclear reactors if you want, if you don't want to burn gas, for example. So there's designs that have thermal storage, for example, built so that they can store a part of the energy as heat and then use that High, high temperature heat to run a turbine another like extra turbine when when there is a lot of demand and the sun is not shining or stuff like that so so it's it's actually a question of do do you want to solve the problems with all of the tools that you have on hand which will mean lower cost and, and lower emissions and lower raw materials needed or do you want to limit your solution to no, we can only use efficiency. No, we can only use uh, smart grids. No, we can only use batteries or, or what what have you. Uh, I had a lot of points for for the other, <laughs> but then you hijacked. hijacked well, my no, I, if you don't mind, I would pass the the the, the, yeah, the, the to word Atte. to to Atte that has been patient enough to, to wait. <laughs> Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is a bit of a jumpy debate on, on, on my side, just quick comments on, on Zirpa's takes on. Uh, I don't see a need to, just like Raul said, just keep all the tools in the toolbox for the Africans, for the LDC countries to have all the technological options possible and help them with all of them. Not say from here that it's only okay for you guys to go solar. The risk, we should never, I don't like this idea that it's nuclear versus renewables. It's both. And the problem is that the 
true option there is fossil fuels and that, that the increased use and continued use of that regarding also actually Russia for, for Russians gas is a huge uh, income source and uh, I'm afraid of a European energy so, uh, policy that will lead into an energy system which has a lot of variable renewables but which is still locked in in the quite strong gas dependency this is the stuff we're seeing with Germany and energy vendor and this is what this is this would keep us locked in geoeconomic way in, in Russia, and also it's not low carbon enough. Uh, as for Russian nuclear power plants, I, I mean, I dis, I really don't like the authoritarian regime in Russia at the moment. But nuclear is actually one of the only low carbon technologies which they have expertise on a global scalable solution. So maybe we could uh, actually this this would be a place to. I don't know, find some common ground, which is challenging because the regime is, is uh, authoritarian and, and shares little of the values we share. But yeah, uh, I actually, I was, I was, uh, 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 Raleigh took my points on, on the load following and flexibility. I would perhaps say that actually, I think we still have in energy debate and, and policy, we are stuck with the uh, looking at the means over ends. So smartness is great thing. Uh, uh, flexibility, great thing. But those are actually solutions to problems caused by the variability. So they shouldn't dictate our energy policy. Uh, we should optimize for the low cost, low carbon, deep decarbonization. Uh, so ends over means. Thanks. Well, since you had the floor, I take the opportunity then uh, to, to to abuse of you at the, <laughs> again, ask you a question in terms of uh, it has been mentioned energy independence. So quite often the, the energy independence stops uh, short in the sense that we are talking about technology and the fuel related to that specific technology which in a way it can be seen as an asymmetric debate because when we are talking about renewables, of course, it's the fuel, it's locally available and it's free. It's, not, it's a different game when we are framing the technology usage in terms of technology and fuel. If we step a little bit back and we see more, we take a look more at the big picture, then we see that it becomes more complicated because we are looking at the resources needed to actually build the technology in the first place. And I think this one is also a, a topic that uh, uh, to, uh, Yoko touched in his, uh, in his uh, discussion. So as a, an, an energy policy uh, and, and, and a politician, how would you actually uh, see the future of our energy mix in terms of uh, energy dependence? Consider that when we are talking about nuclear, yes, fuel comes from abroad and also significant uh, share of the technology comes from abroad in terms of even access to technology necessary to, to deploy nuclear. But on the other hand, renewables are also relying on a number of critical materials, uh, rare earth materials and so forth that are highly concentrated. Uh, China, in that sense, is a superpower in terms of ex um, export of critical materials necessary to build wind turbines and build solar panels. Not just solar panels because they are manufacturing them, but actually resources necessary, necessary to build the technology and the electronics needed for it. So in, in a way or another, once we scale up, and, and we, the, the, the energy in terms of nuclear and or renewables, and, and we step back and we look at the big picture, what kind of resources and energy policy is needed on a large scale. How do you see this dependence, uh, nuclear technology and fuel on one hand and critical materials and resources on the other hand? Considering, and I, then I shut up, <laughs> the, the issue related to the fact that we do not have the technology to reuse or recycle significant share of these critical materials. So once we run out, once the, the uh, solar panels or a wind turbine reach the end of the life, uh, we don't have the technology necessary to recycle it currently. So how do you see this energy independence? Well, the, you touched upon many very good questions uh, regarding this this topic uh, maybe regarding the whole energy independence thing i think it's 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 a good thing but we should uh, i think look at it in two 
different matters. One is security of supply, resilience. And that means that we need to have a certain amount of energy production in our own hands. So that in terms of crisis, in terms of situations like this, uh, where, where we're somehow, the, the no regular flows of, of energy and material don't go, we have something, we, we don't freeze, we, we get the power running. But that doesn't mean that we should be completely energy uh, independent. Uh, that's that's matter. Uh, that's something that uh, that uh, if Norwegians can produce cheaper hydro and wind or Swedes and so on, so it's it's actually good to have international international markets that work. So I would kind of say that that independence itself it's it's not a, like an absolute goal. It's a matter of security of supply and, and uh, resilience. But we, you you actually said really good that there are no energy solutions that would be completely self-sufficient, perhaps biomass to some extent, but that's that that doesn't scale up for the whole needs uh, of ours. So it's it's not just a matter of being secure of security of supply of raw materials, fuels. It's also know-how, technology. Uh, so that's that's something that we should look at. As and I think we're we're learning with COVID situation. Uh, this this is actually a very important part of. Uh, uh, of of uh, any sort of sovereignty or independence is to you have to have the skills and tools. Uh, but regarding the material flows uh, and recycling, that's definitely an issue we need to uh, tackle. Is to be less dependent on on, uh, on China uh, in the material wise, and that means uh, finding uh, and utilizing resources elsewhere, and also putting a lot of effort in, in this recycling and reuse reuse parts but uh, maybe as a final note i would say that the, the denser source of energy we're talking about this the smaller the problem you're talking is because then we come to this issue that we can actually store for example nuclear fuel we can store it uh, quite if uh, quite a lot because it's so dense or or wind turbine parts we could store them and we can tend to fix our, our turbines and so on whereas uh, if we're looking for a combustion based uh, stuff well oil coal they are pretty dense you can store them but they are we don't have them and um, we need to get rid of them uh, biomass a bit of a challenge from this part and of course here the energy storage is uh, our challenge but i think you touched upon i mean this would be an, uh, worthy of an hour of lecture what we, we, because it's brought up so much what is the energy independence i would i would separate between having enough to be secure and resilient but then looking for efficient international options and EU is, is core player here in Nordic countries uh, cooperation as well. And, and yeah, it all comes down also to physics and energy, energy density, density and the form of the energy. So Yoko, we are definitely stepping into your field of expertise. Would you like to respond? Well, I, I have a few, few comments now for what, what I heard. Um, uh, Mention uh, fusion is mentioned. Uh, it should not be mentioned with light, uh, with a light uh, statement like that. You should understand that fusion is very far away, and uh, if you if you look at the basic physics, you are talking about keeping up hundred million Kelvin temperatures continuously and uh, building up uh, extra power plants to, to keep up this uh, plasma going for <coughs> some uh, continuously and commercially. It's, it's, it's a very far concept so far. And the ITER, which is being built in, in, in France, Peter Lund said that, well, why don't we have a look? But this is, have a look. So please, politicians, don't use this fusion word lightly. The other thing I, <clears throat> I, I, I want to raise up as, 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 as a scientist, this electric, electricity storage, it's a real problem. And we don't have enough uh, uh, cobalt to build batteries, not even co for cars. So I just figured out um, the output of the global co cobalt production as an example now. Uh, it's enough for building 6 million electrical cars. And uh, if you start thinking of, of local electricity storage, 
with, with operated with batteries, I mean, then you would need even more of cobalt and it doesn't exist there. The third comment I, I heard from out there, I'm, I'm a little bit um, uh, unaware about your knowing of chemistry and uh, combustion reactions. Uh, if you compare burning one kilo of carbon and one kilo of methane, do you know what, what is the ratio of the CO2 emission of these two processes? Do I have to answer? I don't, I don't have the top of my mind, but of course methane is, uh, I guess it's, uh, you're looking at gas or coal. Gas is much more efficient to burn, so it produces yeah, significantly again, less. You have to know how much. I mean, you have to be able to write, out, write down the equation and go to see the thermo, third thermodynamic tables and see that if you burn one kilo of methane, you produce 25% less CO2 than you produce when you burn one kilo of carbon. So basically 25% reduction is a lot. And we, we, we uh, your, the, uh, both curves, yeah, I, ICPSP curves you, you have shown, uh, in my thinking, they go down too much steeply. We are not going to follow those curves for sure. This is 100% sure. We can st say that we can try, but it, with no means, I mean, this fossil business is so strong that it doesn't matter what kind of political force we have. Though Binden, for instance, during his uh, election campaign promised to invest 17 billion, 700 billion on renewables, this is not enough. And though the investments now in renewables during the last 10 years, they, it has been 2,600 billion US dollars. I, I can, if I can actually interrupt you, last sorry 30, to interrupt you, but years. I think Atte wanted to ask questions or respond. So okay. yeah, quick, quick response, they are steep. They are probably unrealistic, but I would say, compare it to this, that deep decarbonization, the state we want to end up, which is a state where we take out carbon in an industrial level from the atmosphere, that's like building a moon rocket. And we need to start building the moon rocket. And there's no room for new gas investments, even though they reduce the emissions, but they don't fit into this moon rocket. But a variable a system which runs on variable renewables and low carbon that is not the moon rocket, that's an aeroplane. It takes us up, but it, not, it doesn't take us to the, to the moon. It's technically, it's too much, too carbon intensive still. So this is the issue. Even if it's too steep, too fast, it still shows the nature, nature of the transition we should be talking about, which is deep, full decarbonization. And that's the, that's the thing. That's why the gas is problem. Well, I could. I I want to risk. Uh, you, if you if you mean that taking CO two from the air, that's a difficult problem. But if you have a fossil fuel power plant, and you look at the exhaust gases, then you may succeed. If I can actually give the uh, floor to Rowley that raised his hand some time ago, so I think he also had something to contribute to, to this exchange. Yeah, I'll be, be, be brief. Um, I mean, I, I also know that the curves are steep, but they are steep for a reason. And that reason is that we haven't been doing what needed to be done 30 years ago, and then 25 years ago, and then 20 years ago, and on and on and on. We've been just increasing the emissions uh, instead of getting them, them decreasing. So, so there's a reason for that. And now we are in a situation where it looks impossible to, to follow those curves and, and yes. it is probably, but we still need to have that as a target and then do everything we can. I, I, wouldn't, I, I would be careful about using that. No, that's impossible argument because that can lead to stuff like we don't have to do this because 
that is a, a impossible. We have it, there's a matter on the degree of our failure. If we fail a bit, we end up with two degrees or 2.5. That's a totally, completely different world than the one that we end up in three degrees or 2.5 degrees. So there's a degree of, of, of this uh, failure. And even though they are impossible yeah. targets, they are the targets that we need to aim for. Uh, Sipa, you raise your hand. Would you like to contribute? A couple of comments. Firstly, I hear and I understand. Uh, actually, I guess I know that we agree, agree about a couple of points. One is that we are uh, way too late, more than 30 years uh, too late of making these decisions. Second, besides the climate change, the whole energy production consumption uh, uh, paradigm is going to drastically change and the political will uh, is not even close there yet and this is be there nuclear or not. Then the third is that uh, quite legitimately when we are talking about black swans uh, there's uh, legitimate ways of seeing the nuclear risk and that sort of a depends uh, the, the basic attitude. But then the third point, um, uh, if we are talking about small scale uh, fusion uh, reactors and they large scale use, that might be a solution. I wouldn't be holding my breath to have that as a solution to uh, challenge this uh, these, uh, 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 global climate change. But then again, yes, there are some promising avenues and development in battery developments, what we probably have after five or 10 years uh, from now in the markets. Yes, there are that kind of a solar uh, panel and solar energy constructions that reuse 100% uh, first solar, for example. They sort of lease their panels because they uh, reuse the materials. Then, no, I don't think that the nuclear, yes, it is ad uh, adjustable, but you can't adjust it minute by minute. And so long, we do not have the perfect uh, battery solution. Or then, the, uh, of course, water, uh, uh, water power is one solution there. You can't adjust it minute to minute or 15 minutes to 15 minutes. Then, uh, to me, about the energy independence, it's a nice idea like the pharmaceuticals and food independence and independence out of this world, but we are all intertwined. So I think that we can create resilience for some months or small scale, but we are on the deep S, on the deep end, all of us, and we need to solve it globally. Then hydrogen economy combined with the uh, renewables can maybe be one part. It's not the solution, but one part of the uh, solution. And uh, then interesting is that uh, I think that we would need to use this, especially uh, not so, but uh, CCS, the storage, but CCU, because we use quite a amount of uh, uh, CO2 in, in our uh, industrial uh, processes. So we are not going to be carbon neutral, unfortunately, totally anyway, uh, because we can, cannot escape planetary boundaries. Then the big question is, how do we actually increase the efficiency? And this is not sort of a make, a, make the diesel car slightly better, but as a paradigm change. And there we would need to put a lot of uh, work together. And uh, it is a, um, a devil and a, uh, and a saber in disguise what uh, what the digitalization is doing. It's a huge energy consumer, but also uh, the platform economy, the in internet of uh, energy. And in Finland, in, in Lappel at the university, there's interesting avenues here too. Could provide uh, some possibilities on, on this adjustment uh, side. But I think that we need all these uh, elements and we can do it with all these other elements uh, besides the nowadays existing uh, in, uh, nuclear 
uh, it's uh, too expensive, too slow. Uh, and uh, uh, it, still, I do not believe that it marries well with the renewables and energy efficiency economy. But this is just my opinion. Uh, with some evidence, uh, sorry to say. I, I see that Rowley raised his hand uh, for quite some time. Would you like to respond or contribute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a couple of points since since that Black Swan was was mentioned again. That was something that I wanted to comment on earlier, but then you jumped me with the smart trades and stuff. So actually, uh, when you look at these studies on, on, for example, the risks of nuclear or, or uh, what kind of health effects you have, from different sources of energy production, those future black swan events are accounted for as much as possible in, in those studies. So, so they do a lot of risk analysis 10,000 years into the future or 100,000 years into the future with the waste. And uh, yeah, it's still our safest energy source uh, that we have pretty much at the same level as wind and solar. I mean. And, and many orders of magnitude more safer than anything based on combustion of, of, of fuels. Uh, another kind of type of risk perception, I would say is that there's also some unknown risks or maybe there are known risks, but not discussed that wildly with, with expanding the renewable energy supply and these more creeds and, and Big, big high voltage lines. There's already already some quite a bit of opposition opposition for for the transmission lines in Germany, for example, the projects to bring the elect, cheap electricity from the wind farm in, farms in north to the south, where the industry is has been going much slower uh, than it should have been. We have not analyzed what kind of opposition there would be if we actually started to take large amounts of land to deploy solar farms and, and even more wind farms, because at some point they start to compete with what people would like, maybe do something else with the land or maybe leave it to the nature or uh, just leave it to the biodiversity and stuff like that. So there's a lot of risks here that we should talk about and we should try to model and, and measure, but actually in, in most of the scenarios and reports that I have done, this has not been looked into. So we are just assuming that we can build like like the, the chart in, in Yoko's uh, presentation that there, there's gonna be this much of solar, maybe, but it's a lot more than we have now. And there might be issues coming with siting because you want them to have good siting, good sites for, for maximum production and stuff like that. And those are always limited and they might have other uses. So these things I think need to be studied more because I don't know, maybe it will all go fine, but this is something that we don't know. And, and actually the evidence has been that the more that you bring these to, uh, for example, wind farms, the more people start to oppose them because they think it's it's invasive or they don't like how they see when they go to their summer cottage and, and stuff like that it's i mean it's too bad but it's it's human nature uh, so let, uh, just please short, please on please. the too slow and too expensive front uh nuclear has been the fastest way to build clean electricity on a per capita basis even Olki Loto 3 alone, taking 16 years from start to finish, has been faster than wind and solar combined in Germany with hundreds of billions of investments as support mechanisms for those. Olki Loto 3 was built with private money. So to say that it's too slow is also to say that, well, then renewables are hopelessly way more slower. And also about the expensive, I guess the aim of policy and taxonomy and all these things is to try to find ways to make clean and electricity cheaper. If nuclear is, is expensive, it's that for a reason. And I actually have been studying a lot of those reasons. And I'm, I know that they don't have anything to do with fundamentally the technology or the energy source. They are more, more to do with inexperienced construction uh, first of a kind products, 
um, incomplete designs when you start building. Uh, nuclear has been, uh, there's many more cases of successful and on budget nuclear construction around the world than, than there is of those failures. And we know the reasons for those failures. So we could, we should do our best to mitigate those and get this, the similar level of, of support that other clean energy has. Thank you. I give the floor to Sirpa because she raised the hand and, and then also I would like to uh, just uh, book a question uh, for all of you that will come from a question that came from the chat uh, related to what Rauli was saying. So uh, Sirpa, please go ahead. Firstly, yes, there's a lot of modelings and I've looked at them, them too about how safe uh, the nuclear is. Uh, 10,000 or 100,000 years from now. But that kind of is the black swan's idea that they are hard to model or non-existence modeling for such a time span and probabilities. So uh, you, you cannot take that as, as a antibiotic test, whether it works or not. Then about people opposing, quite often you take it in solar panels or being uh, mills that okay it's not pretty uh you can't build it close to national park or it has the noise you do not have the same claims i don't know if the nuclear is uh uh, uh pretty and there's the opposition against uh, a nuclear too and did anyone ask uh, uh, with the heavy industry how people like it or don't like it it to be built of course there's uh, different um opinions and uh, public opposition here too, but that is much more modular to uh, to build. So, uh, sorry, I, I really do not uh, uh, buy your, uh, uh, with all friendship, your your claims on, on this. So, I, I will come back to the issue of uh, uh, um, risk and more in general to social acceptance because uh, you are not getting out so easily <laughs> about such an issue on both sides. But um, uh, in, in con going back for a moment to what you, um, you already just said before, in terms of like um, uh, the amount of energy that we are actually able to produce and put on the field per capita, there, was a, a, there were a number of questions in that sense framed in a different way. Through, so I tried to summarize them. So once we make a comparison, because that is the topic of the debate, it's not just either or, but like when, when we make a comparison of these two energy systems, how they would actually perform side by side looking ahead. Uh, there were questions about, uh, on one hand, the amount of uh, energy we can actually produce per day. Uh, there was this uh, redistribution per day. So let's take, let's assume that it takes uh, between 15 to 20 years to plan, build, and run, and start to actually have a positive energy budget in terms of nuclear energy uh, technology. So like how much energy can we actually produce per day once we stretch over the period necessary to build a nuclear power station, how much actually energy we can put on the field per day on average? This one was was a question that was uh, framed in this way. And then it was claimed that nuclear work on such a large scale that even when you consider delays, and perhaps this one is a different way to frame what you, you already just said, uh, well, even in, if you consider delays and we consider the amount of low emission kilowatt production that we put on the field, nuclear has, tend to have a performance uh, that um, it's better than than the correspondent, for example, solar energy production. This one was the question, how it was framed. And on the other hand, there is the issue of land use. So it's like once we talk, uh, we take in consideration that mm, the energy density that we can actually associate to nuclear energy production, the amount of space necessary to produce a certain kilowatt. Uh, then we compare to the wind pro power production or the solar power production, then again, there is a different in performance. So how you all would actually frame or respond to these kind of questions when the choice is about like probably 
decision making process as as a citizen is like i need to support one or the other after raise you raise your hand so at least what i can see you have the floor oh thank you thank you this is this uh first of all i have to say that this is all takes a lot of i mean what types of assumptions and definitions you use to get different figures but what you're essentially talking about is energy rate of uh, return on investment so how much energy you get from putting the energy to build up a, a power source and how much you get out of it. And here, nuclear power beats uh, wind and solar, clearly. And uh, the, ba the bad news Come is on. the fossil fuels are really good at this as well. But uh, but the, the good side that the, the solar and wind have, which uh, Sirpa brought up already, is that they are more modular. You have smaller units, you, so you can, I would say, when you build nuclear, you build like this. When you build... Uh, solar and wind you build like this. But this is an oversimplification because, of course, you have smaller modular designs of uh, nuclear power. And then if you talk about large-scale solar, a desert tech or something, that's a mega project. So it, it's, it's, uh, it takes a lot of time. Uh, regarding land use, I would... Uh, now, I'm quoting out of my head, but I think the scales are pretty correct. So, uh, again, it, it depends on how you define the issue, but it would, it's, it's around that nuclear and fossil fuels are, are around like... 0. Point something uh, square meters per megawatt hour. Wind is 10 times that, that's one. Solar is 10 times that, that's one. And biomass is 10 times that, that's like hundreds. So uh, this is, it's hard for so different sources of energy to use this type of measures, but it does give the scale. It's about energy density. And that's something that uh, the nuclear has, uh, has really, really, Good, uh, makes it a really good energy source. But again, there are other reasons why wind and solar are then really good energy sources as well. Does anyone want to respond to this issue? Well, I can comment a little bit. Uh, there's been some studies on 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 the land use of, of different, like, like you said, that was pretty rough. It actually, depending how you want to look wind, if you only take the turbine, building then it's it's what you said but if you take like if you have a wind park and how much area it it kind of takes then it's actually it takes more space than than solar so it depends on how you shift of course the kind of intensity intensity of the land use there there matters because you can do other stuff in the grounds you can farm or you can grow forest or and, and do other limited maybe maybe not live in inside a wind farm but but all this other kind of kind of stuff you can do there uh so it's not so intense uh whereas biomass is actually that's kind of worse because it's it takes a lot of space and it takes it really intensely especially if you have annual crops that you plant and then after a couple of months you you take away with forests it's a bit bit different especially here in north where they grow quite slow compared to eucalyptus tree plantations somewhere where it's like 20 years and then you cut everything in 20 years and stuff like that so here we have a little bit more kind of time for the nature to also be there so it's not that bad but uh, it's still not the same thing as a natural forest but uh, of course uh, but i guess yeah that's my answer. Sirpar, you, you raised your hand. Please go ahead. Well, I guess, um, well, I don't disagree about uh, the scale what we need for biomass or solar or wind energy. Solar in that sense is in, in theory, but this is probably a purely theoretical models. Uh, if you would sort of cover all the um, major building rooftops all over the Europe and the roads, you would get it. Uh, the, the production. Uh, of course, in the real life, it just doesn't go one to one, but it gives gives the scale that there actually is that kind of a used space. And in sometimes, if you think, for example, parking uh, parking lots or uh, some other places, uh, well, roads could be an example. Um, uh, the shade would be an extra benefit for for the users. But I guess the main point here is that 
we have to bear in mind the planetary boundaries. And sometimes I have a feeling in this discussion that we are going to find a miracle cure that you could double and triple and tenfold the population resource uh, consumption. And uh, a big deal of our energy we have to remember goes to the product consumption that is short term, short the time span, be it electronics or textiles or whatever. So we would need to uh, make, make a major change there because we still, unfortunately, are living within the planetary uh, uh, boundaries and we would uh, need to start taking this seriously and not to think that there would be one panacea. And even though I love this debate and hopefully we can go on for quite some time still, I think that this yes or no nuclear actually is a bit of a sideline of the debate because uh, nuclear is not the panacea. The solar is not the panacea. Or any other way, we would need to be a drastic uh, reshifting of our uh, energy production con uh, consumption and efficiency uh, uh, roadmap in, in, in Europe and globally. And actually, uh, the China does a lot of uh, and wonderful good things on this field and an awful lot of bad things in coal and nuclear also on the other end. So I'm not trying to glorify the road and build initiatives and others. Did I see Raoul? I know, uh, Yoko, you have been waiting, I think, for some time. Please go ahead. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, I, would, I would like to point out where does the energy investment money goes right now? and has gone for the last 10 years, mostly to solar and wind. And I mentioned this number, it's uh, 2,600 billion US dollars. During the same time, the, there's negative investment in nuclear power. So basically, um, if, if, if the Technology would be very good, and uh, I, I, I assume if it's uh, if it's um, it's it's very well tested technology, but it has a drawback which we have not raised so far, and that is a serious drawback: is to storage of the used fuel. There are two hundred fifty thousand tons of used fuel that is lying around the premises of the nuclear power plant on the backyard. And very few countries have taken effort to do something about it. Finland and <clears throat> Sweden have taken first, uh, have taken some serious moves and I've been looking at the, our physics department, what does it take to hide these fuel rocks? And this is not simple technology at all. So basically my major comment on, I fully agree that uh, if you area-wise, nuclear power is superior. I mean, it doesn't take much land area to, to build, uh, but, uh, Technology-wise, it is very complicated technology. For instance, Oculoto 3, I know one person working for the power station. He has that, mentioned that they have 8,000 8, graphics online. And how many times they have been changing the operating systems during these 13 years. So basically the, the drawback, the, 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 the drawback there is that once it takes time to build these bigger things, then these, for instance, electronics and IT uh, methods develop much, much faster than was ex expected in 2003 when Oculoto 3 started. And then the question of small, small fusion, forget it. I mean, that's, 
you should not be talking about small fusion. That's that's. I, I shouldn't say a bad word, but uh, stop talking about small fusion. And uh, and uh, then I know that, for instance, VTT has a, a, a serious program on small uh, nuclear reactors. And uh, assume, and uh, it's claimed uh, that uh, the, these reactors will be produced in a factory and they they are brought on site with a truck and uh, and so on and uh, it's considered this kind of uh, uh, alternative quite easy to use technology but it is not an easy technology to use think about for instance Robakar and Sähkö decides to have nuclear heating for the city of Rovaniemi that would mean that uh, this handling of the fuel rods when used, also purchasing of the nu nuclear fuel would go into very small hands. And uh, do you think that there would be enough trained personnel to be able to truly um, handle these uh, small scale reactors and where are they except in Russian submarines? In that sense, I, I really would like them to, because I saw that both uh, Rauli and Ate uh, rushed to <laughs> raise their hands. So you, you play between you two who is going to answer here. Uh, but then I, I would like to maintain the comparison that we always try to maintain between different technologies. So I think like if we are talking about where the nuclear uh, spent fuel is going to end, Considering that, for example, any scenario that scales up renewables includes, for example, for sure, an entire generational change of the existing deployed renewable energy uh, resources. So all the solar panels, for example, will actually reach the end of life between here and 2050 and all the wind turbines currently installed, the same will actually be replaced before actually even reach the scale we aim to, to reach. So if we maintain a conversation about uh, um, the, 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 the spent fuel, I think it would be interesting to make comparisons like what are the challenges then when we compare them to the challenges of the renewables so that uh, we don't know how to, uh, to my knowledge, the best of my knowledge, how to recycle or to dispose of, but we just have to dump them. So currently, so if we maintain, because I like Yoko uh, approach that we should actually maintain as much as possible the conversation about the existing technology, uh, not to invest or bet too heavily on what's coming. So yes, it's a source of optimism, but just not bet too much. So either uh, Rauli or Ate, I'm not sure yes. which one of you. I was first. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay, just quickly. Uh, yeah, I mean, regarding the sp uh, disposal of spent fuel, uh, it's included in the analysis. Spent fuel has, to my knowledge, never hurt anybody during the last 60 years. Yet there is a lot of kind of people talking how scary and dangerous it is. It's clearly dangerous, but it's it's dangerous if it's unmanaged. It's it's like a bonfire in the midsummer. It's dangerous if it's unmanaged. If people start jumping into it, they will get burned. So they, so they shouldn't. They should stay away and the fire should be managed. With regards to this, a, a good example of, of Rovaniemi uh, bringing a very small mini reactor there to heat the city. Uh, I don't think it's a good idea to all the kind of tiny local Finnish energy companies to become nuclear utilities because there's a lot of bureaucracy a lot of uh, this kind of overhead that you have to do and a lot of expertise that you have to get so but that's that's something that we can think about as a business model maybe there is maybe there is a mankala company for district heating for for local like tvo or fortum takes over uh, those responsibilities and operates the plant but the local uh, utility invests in that plant and kind of owns or then just buys the heat as a service. That's another option. And then these big companies that have all the expertise and all the, all the kind of management practices and all that stuff, they take care of the waste as well. Um, and then you mentioned uh, another fact that 
most of the investments have been gone to solar and wind. Then we need to also ask why. I think it's over 95% of solar and wind investments have gone to supported subsidized markets. So not because they have been better or cheaper as such, which they start now to be. But if you look at the like last 10 years, uh, people have been investing in them because they have gotten a guaranteed return for their investment. So it's no big wonder that people are investing in them. And I just think that, well, that's a great way to start an industry, but it also needs to be able to then continue and pay its own cost when it comes to serious industry. And just to end up in a kind of depressing note regarding what, what Sirpa said uh, earlier, I just uh, ran into an article yesterday or today on what it would take to eradicate poverty from the world. I, I think we share this goal that there should not be like abject poverty. And it would take about five times our current economy. So oh. there's a kind of do you want to save energy and not not use resources or do you want to get rid of poverty and try to find ways how you can use materials use energy with as small footprint and as little damage and harm as you you possibly can and i i i'm a pro human so i choose the latter i think the poor i, I wouldn't want to be poor luckily i'm not i'm really i want the lottery ones uh, but I, I, I think that they have all the rights to to get out of poverty, and that means they're gonna use a lot of resources and a lot of energy, and and we just need to find ways to make that with as little environmental effect as possible. And that's why I think that we also need to include nuclear in a major way on that. Thanks. I would give the floor to, to Ate that raised his hand and then we give the opportunity to Yoko to answer because also there is Sirpa that raised her hand. So Ate, go ahead. Yeah, first of all, would like, uh, well, I completely agree on, uh, on the Yoko's remarks and fusion power. They are spot on. Uh, and Sirpa had it really well with uh, there are no silver bullets. And well, Raul just said that we still have the, the population and the poverty issue that, that makes us that there is demand for energy globally that that's kind of inevitable even taking into account that we are living we are over consumption in, uh, in western countries too but i think regarding yoko's comments i think we're mixing economics and politics just like Raleigh said <laughs> yeah we, we what we've seen in western countries for the last decades is is making nuclear power more expensive quite knowingly by regulation and at the same time, we've been putting a lot of effort on making renewable energy cheaper. Actually, we have binding renewable energy targets within EU. That means, like, of course, there's, of course, there's someone investing in because there's a guaranteed demand for this. If we would have said that, okay, actually, 20% of of uh, EU's electricity or energy should come from nuclear by 2030 or something, we would see a massive flow of, of money in this. So these are politi politics, political decisions that have shaped the the energy economy and. And it, it goes all the way to tiny details. In, for example, in Finland, it, it's, it, if I put up a, a, a solar plant, the, 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 the distributor network cannot actually uh, cover the costs caused by the variability. Uh, to me, it's their problem. So we have, from, from very small to, uh, to European level, we have policy measures that make variable renewable energy cheaper by design, by political design. And we have other policies in place that make nuclear more expensive. And I think this is, we need technology neutral, low carbon policies. That's what we should be seeing. Yes, nuclear is pretty complex technology, but it shouldn't be mystified too much. And the waste issue, it's very dense waste. Dangerous, yeah, but very dense, very controllable. I think uh, my apartment in Kallio could fit most of all of the high level waste in Finland produced during my lifetime. It's very dense. Uh, the scale of the issue compared to kind of open-ended problems like carbon in the atmosphere is completely different. But yeah, it's, it, it has its challenges, and, and uh, but those are manageable. So, But I, I would like to see technology neutral, low carbon uh, policy. Price of carbon, price of land use in place, uh, technology neutral subsidies. Those are the 
stuff that we should be seeing if you want if we were serious with the issue and we put the ends over the means thank you and yoko uh, as you're thank going you. to add uh, your contribution i would like to spice up your answer also with the when one question just came and uh, that perhaps also relates to this if we are considering any recycling possibility related to renewable energy uh, infrastructure uh, uh, quite correctly, someone asked, like, well, recycling usually is actually an energy intensive process. So once we consider the possibility to invest energy to recycle uh, materials that comes from renewable energy sources, isn't there the risk to offset the energy budget at the end, the energy performance of renewable? Just passing the question, feel free. The floor is yours. Okay. Yep. Uh, I'm. Uh... I, I have a recent uh, um, rumors of activi uh, activities in Uvascula actually in recycling precious metals from um, uh, disposed electronics and and so the fact that in in solar panels these uh, precious metals metal um, amounts are extremely small and so basically you have to solar panel is basically sand so the sand is recyclable as we know and uh, also with the wind per wind turbines i mean the, the most massive material you use is steel and steel is quite recyclable it can, it, it can be reused and the blades they they are epoxy epoxy composite composites and those those can be used as hand uh, landfill and so on the precious things in the turbine in the turbine and in basically uh, again you you are talking about very small amounts of these precious materials but here chemistry comes into play and there are there are serious serious plans and projects are already at our university to to get out these precious metals uh, from from a from a bulk bulk um, uh, disposed material, and of course there's handling cost, and uh, this is not uh, also cost free. Uh, it it costs money to, but as as far because I have a chemistry training, uh, I have a PhD in physical chemistry, so basically. I see that th this is not the uh, that high cost that that would uh, make the lifetime energy from these sources uh, too expensive. I see possibilities there. The other thing I, I'd like to comment was this uh, uh, developing countries. I spent a sabbatical year. Sorry to interrupt you. If you can actually just make it faster, so we will have because it's already two past nine, and I really would like to stay here as long as possible. But we have still uh, Sirpa waiting for 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 a contribution. Please go ahead, complete your your argument, Yoko. Sorry. You were finishing up your argument. Hello? Did he freeze? It was on the developing countries, something. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. I was, oh. I was. Yeah. May I, may I finish my argument? So, ATH has made an, made an elaborate study on, on the energy consumption on this planet for 7 billion people. And average is 2,000 watts. And uh, US is consuming 10,000. Europe is 5.5 thousand. Uh, China is coming to 1,800. India is consuming 800. And Africa is consuming 400 watts in average over per person. So this is the average power consumed in Africa per person, 400 watts. So basically, in Europe, we are consuming 10 times more. And in the United States, 25 times more. And the problem is that, can we do something about this? 
and how we do it. Sirpa, you raise your hand some time ago. Sorry for letting you wait. No problem. Actually, it is easy to be called to continue after that question. Uh, how, how do we do it? And of course, we are all pro-human and pro-planet. But because I didn't invent planetary boundaries, uh, I, I would prefer that we could consume for five, or five or five or six planets worth resources in biodiversity and other ways sustainably. While this is not a physiological fact, then it depends how you share the resources. And actually there you already heard some of the figures. And if 1% of the population in the world are richer than half of the nations, you just need to figure out how you balance the consumption, production, and how you make it with tenfold more resource efficient. And do you need to use uh, this uh, uh, single use textiles and products as much as it is? It is a paradigm change. And if you don't take it, like, you know, you can't plan to sail around the world if you think that the world is flat. If you think that the economy is linear, you can't sort of create circular economy and take it seriously. You just think that you could uh, 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 create more and more in de in de uh, uh, indefinitely with as little as possible uh, uh, harm to the environment. But we, if we are over the limits already, over the planetary boundaries, as little as possible harm, more and more harm, just technically won't do the trick. It, it'll fall, uh, not for you and me, uh, but maybe we should be those ones of having and inventing the uh, better, uh, better economies. Then, yes, I agree that the reno renewable shouldn't be uh, hold by subsidies forever. It's a good kickstart. But then again, we all know the amount of fossil fuel subsidies, uh, direct and indirect, in Finland, in EU, and globally, it uh, 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 goes over our global investments on social and health. And this is according to IMF figures. So probably we could uh, trust on, uh, on them. And uh, then the... The point is that when you say nuclear energy is uh, safe, uh, 60 years back history, it's like one day if you compare 600, 6,000, 600,000 of years in the future. And you say, well, look, I have the model. I know how this works. I know that there is isn't a, a major risk. Uh, this is... And if the nuclear is so uh, so unrisky and safe, so why its risk is collectively uh, borne by uh, states and societies? Uh, probably the nuclear power plants could uh, could sort of bear the risk themselves. So I would say that by this way we subsidize pretty heavily the nuclear energy because otherwise it would pay would need to <clears throat> pay quite. Uh, lofty insurance bills for private insurers to cover the uh, unlikely uh, risks. And no. then very uh, quickly about the recycling. There's a lot of stuff. Of course, the uh, renewable energy need to be uh, uh, recyclable. Um, uh, and there needs to be more modularity. And indeed, there are some models already. But we have to see that within 10, a very short time period, Within five and ten years, we have more and more new technologies, like the fi uh, film, uh, solar film technologies, and indeed chemistry is coming up uh, uh, together there for better reuse of these resources. But that should be most uh, must, and need, it needs to be regulated. So this kind of consequences needs to be borne by production, whatever is the sector in in industry. So in it's thank you. Okay, so uh, because we are already almost 10 past nine, so we are approaching the end. So I, I actually use, I want to use one question that came. So I will start from you, Rauli, so I'll give you the possibility also to, to contribute. But I want to uh, start with this question that uh, 
come from the audience is not mine i have some issues with the questions but uh, but i pass it to you uh, and if you can actually uh, limit your answer to one or two minutes including your uh, closing remarks so that we can actually conclude in in a reasonable time so the question is and i i i refer the question so how come uh, the pro renewable people are against nuclear while essentially the, the pro-nuclear people are embracing also the use of nuclear. This is a question that came from the, the, the audience. So I pass it to you and just feel free to, to answer uh, and, and put your closing remarks uh, about it. So Rauli, go ahead. Okay, well, uh, actually I do know a couple pro-nuclear people who don't like renewables, so it's not like but I, I, I would say that it is a strong tendency. And I, I don't know where it comes from. Uh, yeah, I would hope that we could all concentrate on solving the problem, which is actually most of the kind of global harm that our consumption is doing. There's planetary boundaries that we talk about is from CO2 in the atmosphere and from prior diversity laws. And those are stuff that we can solve effectively with clean technologies. Of course, there's other problems, but those are kind of like, uh, in my view, two of the kind of most pressing and, and, and biggest. When it comes to risk and, and insurance, nuclear power plants are all actually insert quite well on many levels and uh, insurance companies actually want them they're, uh, them to be insured by them because they know that they are very low low risk. Of course, eh, eh, nothing is insured up to infinity, but the same goes also for hydro plants. Why don't we talk about insurance for hydro plants? Because they also cause similar kind of very drastic local uh, destruction if, if a hydro plant breaks and, and leaves the villages on top or towns downstream underwater. We should. Like that. Come yeah. Come on. I mean, it's a similar risk perspective, and nuclear no, plants are insured. So I just wanted to correct that because there might have been the kind of idea that they wouldn't be. They are actually quite wanted as an insurance. Yoko, uh, your 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 answer, your closing remarks, and then add yeah, them, then I, I, no, go ahead. I, I, I'm I good. Say if 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 any spent nuclear fuel fuel goes in air, it's a global threat. That's bullshit. Spent fuel nuclear fuel is a tiny solid pellet. If I throw into air, it's it falls I mean, back down on the ground and there it is, and I can pick I it mean, up and put it. I, I was I was Or you mean that somebody face. pulverizes metric tons of this and then blows no, them with no. a giant blower? I don't no, want to no, I don't no, want no, to no. interrupt you I would like to let yeah. you go, but it's already ten past nine. So that's the reason I was asking for your closing remarks. Yeah, in, I just don't want to ask the audience to stay in nine. Based so. on nothing. Uh, any closing remarks uh, at the end of this discussion? Yoko? Closing re remarks. Um, well, um, I just convey that the, the change of CO2 reduction will be slower than we expect. And uh, for instance, my lifetime, it, is, it will not be a problem, but it will be a problem for my grandchildren. And uh, we need all the good things and we need more smart um, electronics and uh, IT concepts to control complicated energy systems. And, uh, and uh, for instance, in Scandinavia, we should make a big, a merge, merger of uh, wind power and hydropower that are talking to each other smartly. The, there are many, many other options we have not been talking here on, on, on controlling the electricity consumption in the society. And, uh, and uh, there's lots of work to, to be done. And uh, the, all, uh, the other thing which I'm worried about is that we have to also address the new generations on these energy issues and get them excited about developing these methods. And for some reason, I, I, I don't know, 
that uh, nuclear has not is not the one choice for the younger generation right now. This is my concluding remarks. Have a nice Easter. Thank you. Ate and then Sirpa, go ahead. Yeah, thank, thanks all, all of you with, for the lively debate and excellent arguments. I would like to conclude with, uh, with Sirpa's excellent point on planetary boundaries. Those are inevitable, but we have to also look at which boundaries we hit first. And the problem now is not the energy use per se. It's, as Rauli mentioned, it's the carbon em emissions and the stress on uh, land and sea ecosystems. And fixing these problems actually requires a lot of clean energy. And that means energy that does not produce carbon emissions and has a very limited land use uh, uh, demand. And for that, it's pretty much wind, solar and nuclear, which are, there, 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 are, there are reasons to use hydro, there are reasons to use biomass also, there, there's geothermal and everything, but these are the parameters we should use uh, and optimize. And uh, I'm very worried about the current level of energy debate and the energy policy, which again, as I said, puts uh, means over ends and mixes economics with politics. Um, and this is stuff that I would love to see, like solution-based uh, discussion and policy making uh, regarding this. But excellent remarks from everyone here. Uh, I got to run soon to get my bicycle. It was fixed. And actually, I would like to bring up that I think bicycle is one of the energy economically, energy economy-wise best innovations ever made by man. And it kind of tells the story also that new is not always better than old. If we have working tricks that worked in the past, we could, we are, if we're smart, we use them again uh, in the future as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ate. Uh, very interesting remarks, considering that this has been organized from university that is in the uh, capital of the winter cycling. So we take some pride in it. <laughs> and uh, Sirpa, go ahead. You're concluding, concluding your remarks. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for University of Oulu, uh, the organizers, and my good fellow uh, uh, debaters for excellent debate. And uh, hopefully we could get physically together at some point to continue next five hours, the same be uh, debate and why not over the internet. Um, uh, still, sometimes we tend to, uh, tend to oversimplify the questions when it comes to uh, energy change and uh, the planetary boundaries. But to give the answer uh, to these questions as a comment, if you could please put my the first slide still, because there it is. It is how you see the risks for thousands of years from now, the black swan, the risk perception. Could you do it with less risks? So keep it simple, stupid. Then the scale and pace of decarbonization, what you can do by 2030 and 2040, then actually uh, uh, the uh, renewables and nuclear said it's it's the unfortunate mismatch. If you say that you can develop both uh, with the same pace, uh, that's economically and technically not um, not feasible. And then there's the business profitability loss that we shouldn't sort of artificially try to. Uh, revive uh, and then uh, uh, revive. So these, I guess, are the different points of view that we are having on on this debate. And when it comes to planetary boundaries, and this is my conclusions to take it seriously, please uh, go and Google it a bit. Firstly, we are using 1.5 uh, uh, planets uh, uh, worth resources every year. We would need three planets or even more by 2050. And uh, well, actually, the Western countries like ourselves are using already the worth three planets. So uh, it is not the climate first, and we shouldn't think it only that way, but as I said already, it is the point of biodiversity. It is a point of re uh, uh, resources, land use, the new emerging risks, chemicalization and so we better be able to think many things sim simultaneously and uh, uh, get sort of a from them from uh, the old linear way both in energy 
and in resources uh, to 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 the new paradigm. And hopefully, this discussion gave a food for thought to, uh, for people to start thinking with their own brains uh, and to looking uh, for the future a bit longer and uh, trying to make the evaluations. What are the possibilities? Thank you. Thank you so much to all our panel members and um, looking forward for uh, future opportunities indeed to be uh, all in the same room discussing about these topics. Um, talking with the audience that has been following us through Vimeo, please uh, let us know through comments what you thought about it. And uh, if you have uh, interest for future debates and if you want to narrow it down to different aspects that perhaps you have been heard about just mentioned today you would like to to know more or discuss more about these issues and in the meantime i thank you all once again and i wish you all a Easter. thank you thank you Take care everybody be safe thank you Have Antonio. A happy thank Easter. you bye bye be safe. happy bye Easter. Bye. happy Easter. antonio you can put my slides on the website if you like i will okay Thank you. And the same goes with the others. If you have materials that you want to share, uh, please send it to me and I will share it. Yeah, it's okay. okay. Bye bye. Take care. Bye, bye, bye. everybody. Bye bye. Bye.